This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Welcome to today. I speak very briefly. I'm Colin Blakemore. Um, we um, are grateful to the visit uh, of Margaret Livingston, who's the first um, speaker, as the excuse for organising this, uh, this meeting. But it represents, I think, a growing interest in the Centre for the Study of the Senses in um, aesthetics um, and in the relationship between philosophy, aesthetics, the arts in general, and, and neuroscience, what neuroscience can bring to the table. So you see that mixture reflected in the programme today, as it was in our pre- previous uh, workshop on, um, um, the parado- on the paradox of pictures. Um, so I'll hand over immediately to Barry Smith, who's the director of the Institute of of uh, philosophy to chair the first session. So good morning everyone, um, I'm very glad to see you here and very glad to be introducing Margaret Livingston who is a professor of neurobiology from the Harvard Medical School. She's a visual neurophysiologist whose work tells us uh, a great deal about how the eye and the brain are working to provide us with the kind of experience we have both in everyday life and the extraordinary experiences we have when we're looking at art. And many of you will know her book, uh, Vision and Art, uh, The Neurobiology of Seeing. And today we have Margaret talking to us about what art can tell us about the brain. Margaret, welcome. So I am a visual neurophysiologist. I try to figure out how we see by recording from neurons at various levels in the visual system. But I acknowledge that artists also try to figure out how we see, and that many works of art are great because they figure out or reveal important things about how we see. Now, of course, there are many works of art that reveal important things about human culture or human psychology, and of course those are important, but since I work on low-level vision, I'm mostly gonna talk about works of art that reveal important things about how we see. So we have known for a long time that a line drawing can represent a scene. And it's so common and and so ubiquitous that you have to stop and think that the world isn't full of lines. It's full of contours and discontinuities. And yet we use lines to represent contours and discontinuities. And the reason this works so well is that cells in your visual system are organized in such a way that this is a recording by Steve Kufler from 1953. He shined a spot of light on the retina and got a barrage of signals from a retinal ganglion cell. And then he shined a bigger spot of light on the retinal ganglion cell. He shined more light on the retina and paradoxically he got a smaller response. So the line indicates when the stimulus was turned on. So then he shined a spot, an annulus of light on the retina, and he got a suppression of firing. So Steve deduced that what retinal ganglion cells do is that they're excited by light in the center of their part of the visual field they care about, but they're inhibited by light in the immediate surround. We call this center surround antagonism. And in case you don't believe me that your visual system is full of center surround cells. Do you see the little gray spots everywhere where you're not looking? Okay, and the reason that it's everywhere you're not looking is postgraduate. But the reason that you see the little gray spots at the intersections is because cells at the intersection, center surround cells at the intersection have more bits of white in their inhibitory surround than cells at the cross pieces. They only have two bits of white in their inhibitory surround. So these cells are more inhibited, they're less active, so the intersections look darker. You have to have an extra synapse to get this uh, surround antagonism, so there's a tiny temporal delay, which is manifest in this version of the Hermann grid illusion. You see the little sparkly, because they have a little temporal delay for the same reason. So if, if I convey anything to you today, I hope I convey the idea that vision is information processing, not image transmission. It doesn't do you any good to send a high resolution image to the back of your brain because there is nobody up there to look at an image. All you've got up there is neurons and all they can do is fire or not fire. So because of that, visual computations are simple, 
All neurons can do is fire or not fire. All they can do is make the next neuron in the hierarchy fi more or less likely to fire or not fire. Computations are local because neurons are little tiny cells and they can, can't, can't transmit information very far. And the computations are often opponent with one neuron inhibiting another neuron. So if you have an image like this, dark on one side and light on the other, center surround cells over here are activated in their center, but they're inhibited in their surround. Center surround cells over here aren't active. So it's only center surround cells at the discontinuity, at the contour, where there's an imbalance between the center and the surround that are active. So center surround cells turn a discontinuity into a line drawing. This is information, because where is the information in an image? It's where are the contours, right? So if you, you can see this if you've ever tried to save an image on a computer. So if you try to save this image, just light on one side, dark on the other, as a TIFF file, which records the value of every pixel in your image, it's a huge image, right? But you can compress this image on your computer by, by saving it as a JPEG. And JPEG does just what your visual system does. It records where the discontinuities are and what the sign of contrast is across the discontinuity. That's efficient information processing. And this slide is just to remind me how efficient the information process, the information conveyed in a line drawing can be. But it also allows me to point this out, which is what color are the lines in this drawing? This is not hard. Come on. Black. Yeah, the lines are black, right? What, what color is this screen? Can we call it white? Oh, thank you. That's much nicer. Yeah, so the screen, can we say the screen is white just for deep argument's sake? Yeah, all right, gray, fine. <laughs> but it's not black, right? So the amount of light coming to your eye from those lines is the same as the amount of light coming to your eye from this white screen. So, this, so your visual system simply doesn't care at all how much light is coming to it from any point in the visual scene. What it cares about is contrast. And you can see this also in any painting about, of a candle lit scene. So Ter Bruggen painted this image of a boy and, and it looks sort of plausible, right? So I took a photograph of a boy with a candle and this is a veridical record of the light coming to my eye from this candle lit scene. And it doesn't look like this, right? And I think there's a graph under here of the light, which should fall off with the square of the distance from the source of light. We're assuming that this is the source of light in these two images. So this is physically plausible. The light falls off from the square of the distance. It's completely impossible that the amount of light reflected to your eye from his shirt should be the same as the amount of light reflected from the source of light that's illuminating the shirt. But I was there. This is not what it looked like to me. Because of my center surround cells, the scene looked like this. I could see my son's face and the candle as approximately the same luminance. So Ter Bruggen was painting what he saw, not what was there. So early, now I want to talk about the fact that the visual world is mapped onto early visual cortex. So if you look at early visual cortex and you march across early visual cortex, you march across different parts of the scene of where you're looking from the center of, of, of vision to, to the periphery. And, that, and because of the way inhibitory and excitatory neurons are organized, any long range connections are always excitatory. Inhibitory neurons are always local. So that means that inhibition is local in visual space in early visual cortex. So here's an example of luminance, luminance processing being locally opponent. All of these dots are the exact same gray. I made this in Photoshop. It's the background that's graded in luminance but obviously the, the ones that are on the light background look dark and the ones on the dark background look light. Contrast is locally opponent. So these two sets of checks are identical, but these look lower contrast and these look high because of their immediate surround. The stripes in the middle are vertical, but they look off vertical because of the surrounding orientation. 
This dot is moving vertically, but it looks like it's moving off vertically because of the opponency, the surround opponency in motion. All these rings are the exact same gray, but the color is locally opponent. The rings on the left look more blue, that is less yellow, and the ones on the right look more yellow, that is less blue. You can also see surround opponency and opponency in time if you look at this little black dot for just a few seconds and keep in mind that what you're looking at is white letters and now you're going to get an after image of yellow letters from the white letters. So white letters should not give you a yellow after image. What's giving the, the after image is the surround opponency. And of course artists know this. Monet painted a blue shadow in his haystacks with yellow surround. So now I want to talk about the fact that the fact that these that these computations are local and opponent gives you some interesting insights into the way artists portray depth. So you would think that depth is the kind of computation that would require information across your whole visual field, right? Because it's all about how the whole visual field is organized. But no, even something like depth is computed locally. So there are people who do computer graphics. This is a computer graphics image that's made using what's called a ray tracing program. So computer graphic people think that you need to make you need, need to make your image obey the laws of physics and that the, ray, the way rays of light bounce off things in an image is important for conveying a sense of depth. But for, oh, let me talk about how we see depth. So you look out on the world and it's vividly three-dimensional, right? It looks three-dimensional. Come on, you have to agree with me, <laughs> right? Okay, I know the world is three-dimensional. But the way you see it as three-dimensional is with two flat retinal images. You start with two flat images, and from these two flat images, your brain computes distance and depth. We don't have sonar, we can't ping things and see how far away they are. And so your visual system uses all kinds of information to compute distance and depth. It uses relative motion, so when you move, things that are near move more than things that are far away. It uses shading, perspective, occlusion, things in front, and stereopsis, which I'll talk about at the end. But the fact that these computations start locally in a small part of the visual field means that for centuries, artists have ignored the laws of physics. And nobody has cared because we don't go around making sure that the laws of physics are being obeyed. It's a given. We don't have to. So you can have paintings where you have shadows, how could I lose something as big as that pointer? <laughs> oh, here it is. Right. You can have shadows going in orthogonal directions. No one cares. You can have a vase of flowers that is casting a shadow into the sun. Here's Canaletto's Piazza San Marco. It's at the Fogg Museum at Harvard. The shadows on this side of the painting are going this way. There are shadows on this side of the painting going that way. So when I mentioned this, a curator at the Fog said, oh, that's because the light reflects off this building and causes the shadow. So I went to the Piazza San Marco, and that does not happen. I'm sorry. Nobody cares. Here's a painting by Edward Hopper. Nice, sh uh, this window shines light over on this wall, but this thing doesn't cast a shadow. Nobody cares. Here's a manger that is seen from above on the left and from below on the right. Now, I do not contend that halos should obey the laws of physics, <laughs> but they should at least be internally consistent with what they occlude. Magritte was playing with the laws of occlusion. You find any painting that's got a mirror in it, and I guarantee you it is not obeying the laws of physics. If this lady were looking at herself, you would not see her face in the mirror, right? Even Vermeer, he paints this nice shiny brass bowl, but if you look at the brass bowl, what it's reflecting doesn't have anything to do with what's on the tablecloth underneath it. Nobody cares. So something else that artists figured out long before us neuroscientists is that color and luminance can do different things for you in a painting. And don't worry, I'm gonna define luminance, okay? Picasso said colors are only symbols, 
reality is to be found in luminance alone. So you have three cones in your retina, short, middle, and long wavelength. You see color by comparing or subtracting using opponency. The activity in pairs of cones. You see luminance by summing the activity in all the cones. So this is the color version of this image, and this is the luminance version. It's just how much how, how, how light something appears. So most color contrast borders also carry a luminance contrast, but you can have color contrast without any luminance contrast, and when you do, very peculiar things happen. And of course, artists figured this out. This is a very bad reproduction of Monet's Impression Sunrise. You have to go to Paris and see the original at the Marmitan. The sun looks absolutely brilliant. It seems to shimmer. It looks light and dark at the same time, and it has this weird, eerie quality. So I once got a small grant from Harvard to measure the luminance of the sun in Impression Sunrise, and it turns out that despite the fact that the sun looks absolutely brilliant, it's, it's the same luminance as the background. Oh, this is really strange. So, and I think it's actually the, the fact that there is no luminance contrast that gives it this weird quality. And that's because your visual system and the primate visual system in general, input comes from the retina, ends up in primary visual cortex, but then it splits off into these two major processing streams, a dorsal where system and a ventral what system. So the what system is a primate add-on to the basic mammalian visual system. Um, among mammals, only primates have well-developed color vision and have the ability to scrutinize stationary objects and make fine visual distinctions. So Pete, we know, we know what the, the what system does or the where system because of what happens to people who get lesions in that part of their visual system. So people with lesions in the ventral stream get what are called agnosias. They can see objects, but they can't tell you what they are. They can't recognize them. And you can get surprisingly specific kinds of agnosias, and I'll tell you about that later. You can lose the ability, for example, to selectively fail to recognize faces. That's called prosopagnosia. The wear system, the one that we share with other mammals, we call it the wear system because it contain, carries information about motion and depth and figure ground segregation. Some investigators call it the how system because they think it's how we interact physically with our environment. Here are some drawings made by patients with parietal lobe lesions. These patients were asked to draw a bicycle, a bicycle, a cross, and a clock. So you can see that they get all the bits right of each thing, but they, don't have, they haven't organized these bits in the right spatial organization. It's almost like a cubist drawing. This is not to say that Picasso had a parietal lobe lesion, but rather that he may have cottoned on to the idea that we process what something is made up with and how those things are organized. So what's important now for what I want to talk about is the fact that the wear system, like other mammals, is essentially colorblind. So I'm going to try to convince you that your ability to see, oh, wait a second, let me, let me, see what I, let me say what I mean by colorblind. So if you had a red spot on a green background and you took a black and white photograph of it, you get a gray spot on a gray background, right? And you can imagine that you could vary the relative brightness of the red until you got exactly the same gray. That's equal luminance. And weird things happen at equal luminance because there's a whole part of your visual system that sees the world in shades of gray. And so for me, this has got that weird shimmery quality. And maybe this one has that weird shimmery quality. It has nothing to do with the saturation of the color, like in Monet's Impression Sunrise. It's just the, the lack of luminance contrast that makes it look weird. So I'm going to try to convince you now that your ability to see depth, spatial organization, and figure ground segregation are carried by a colorblind part of your visual system. Now to do this, I'm going to try to make a video turn up here. Uh, it's this one, right? Yeah, okay. Ha, huh, that works. Now I'm going to make the green darker and the red brighter. 
Yeah, okay, so now with the, when the red is brighter than the green, this thing looks three-dimensional, right? Uh, I want to do this one now, right? And when the red is darker than the green, it looks three-dimensional. It's not three-dimensional, right? It's flat. Um, and it, it, the direction that it's rotating is ambiguous, and some of you will see it flip. Don't worry. So now as I make the red brighter, I hope you see it looking flat and squishy and then looking three-dimensional again. Did you see that? Let's go back through equal luminance. It's three-dimensional, it's flat and squishy, and now it's three-dimensional. Did you see that? Oh, I bet you're colorblind. We'll get there, don't worry. Maybe you'll have another one that'll work. I did that. Right, so now I want you to look at this image, and you can see that the artist has used a lot of depth cues, right? He's used perspective and shading, but I bet you I can make this look more three-dimensional. Now, who needs glasses? Raise your hand. No, oh, good. Oh, he's got, I'll give you mine. What I want you to do is close, close one eye and then look through the red lens at this image and see if it looks more three-dimensional when you, thank you, when you introduce a luminance contrast by blanking out the blue. So does it look more three-dimensional when you look just through the red lens? All right, glasses down, glasses down, glasses down. Come on, you, I don't want to spoil it, okay? Because it's more fun to see it appear. This image, again, has a lot of depth cues, perspective, but it's hard to figure out what's going on even in this image. And I hope you will find that if you close one eye and look through the red lens, that you see more depth from perspective. And, and the whole thing, the whole figure ground segregation works better. You can figure out what's going on better when all you've done is take away part of the luminance in the image. Okay, glasses down. Monet painted a whole bunch of versions of this cathedral in Rouen. And because it's just a beige stone building, it's all about the way light plays off of three-dimensional surfaces. And most, in most of the versions, you can see the depth from shading in the luminance version. In some of them, whoops, wait a minute, what happened to, oh, I lost it. Oh, it's, it got moved, here it is. This is the Rouen Cathedral at sunset. It's at the MFA in Boston. And it looks flat and shimmery because in this case, it, at sunset, the building faces west. There isn't much luminance contrast in the doorway or the rose window. And Monet conveys that with using equal luminant paints. I have to go backwards to this one. This is uh, Lichtenstein's version series of the Rouen Cathedral, and it doesn't much look like the Rouen Cathedral, does it? Close one eye and look through the red lens. I think he was playing with this. Okay. And I think Andy Warhol was playing with this same idea of it, it being hard to see depth from in, a, in an equal luminant or equal value. For those of you who are in art, I forgot to say this. Equal value is the same as equal luminance. This is the bottom half of his Brooklyn Bridge poster. It's a little hard to see what's going on here, but in this one, same image, but with a luminance contrast, you can see the, the depth from perspective. So if it is true, if I've convinced you that your ability to see depth is carried by a colorblind part of your visual system, then it doesn't matter what color artists use as long as the luminances are appropriate to convey a sense of three-dimensionality. This is Andre Durand's portrait of Matisse. And the shadows are just weird colors. You couldn't imagine any way of getting them. And yet, if you knew Matisse, you would recognize him right away because although the shadows are weird colors, the luminance is exactly right to convey the shape of his face. And Matisse and his lady in a hat did the same thing, upset everybody when it first came out. The planes of her face are completely weird colors. He was doing what Picasso said. He was using color symbolically, but the reality was there in the luminance alone. The shape of her face is just fine. Okay, so I hope I've convinced you that your ability to see depth, spatial organization, and figure ground segregation are carried by a colorblind part of your visual system. Now I want to try to convince you that your ability to see motion is carried by a colorblind part of your visual system. And to do that, I'm going to show you the stripes. And let me see if I can remember which one. Okay, that goes the speed, right? No, that does the green. Okay. 
this does the speed. I'm going to get them about medium speed. So you can see that these two sets of stripes, if the green is brighter than the red, they look like they're going at the same speed. And if the green is darker than the red, they look like they're going at the same speed. But if you look off to the right, like at the right edge of that scene, if I can get this about equal luminant, I hope you'll see, if you don't cheat and look at the middle, that the ones on the left seem to be going slower than the ones on the right. But you know they're not. You can cheat and look at the middle and see. Now they're going faster, and now I can slow them down and get them to go slower than the ones on the left. I hope you see that. Okay. So if your ability to see motion is colorblind, your ability to see that something is stationary is colorblind, right? And I think that the Impressionists achieved a sense of motion in many of their paintings by using colors that were close to equiluminant. So Monet's poppies are highly visible to your what system, but your where system can't see them because they're close to equiluminant, equal value with the background. So their position is indeterminate. They can seem to move. Now, I don't know if Monet deliberately did this or knew he was achieving motion in his paintings, although the art critics, art historians often say he was, but I know Mondrian knew he had achieved a sense of motion in this painting because the title is Broadway Boogie Woogie. The original's at the moment in New York, it's about this big across, and it's absolutely nauseating how it jumps around. And I think it jumps around because the yellow checks are highly visible to your what system, but they're almost equal luminant with the off-white background, so they can seem to jump around, especially every time you move your eyes. Advertisers do this all the time. If you open Wired magazine, you can probably find a headline or an ad that's got text of one color against an equal luminant background. And I think advertisers do this because the jittery quality of equal luminant writing is attention getting. And it's hard to read, which I'll talk about it at the end. And I think that's something advertisers like because it gets you to pay attention just a little bit longer than usual. So I hope I've convinced you that your ability to see motion, depth, spatial organization, and figure ground segregation are carried by a colorblind part of your system and that the computations are local and opponent. Now I want to talk about the fact that color perception is carried by a low resolution part of your ventral stream, your what system. That is, you do not have to color inside the lines. And of course, artists figured this out a long time ago. Many watercolor artists, pastel artists, will draw a contour and then put some color somewhere on the image. And the color conforms to the object much better than the artist shows it as. It's part of the artistic interest that the color spreads until it hits the border. Here's an illusion that Bianjo Pina made that takes advantage of this. So your visual system doesn't use color per se to define objects because the resolution is low. Instead, your visual system lets the color spread till it hits a border. So I hope you see the donut as yellower than the hole or the background. It's not. I made this in Photoshop. The donut is exactly the same color as the hole and the background. It's just a yellow line inside a blue line. But because the, the yellow has a low luminance contrast with the white, the yellow spreads until it hits another border. So it spreads into the donut. I'm going to use after images to make some blurry colors so that you can watch your color spread till it hits a border. What I need you to do is to look in all these images right at that intersection, right there between those three shapes. And then I'm going to show you a homogeneous gray background. And you're going to see an after image right here. OK. Look at the intersection again and see if you don't see a better after image in this achromatic image. Now, some of, you saw a little better, right? Now, some of you are saying, well, of course you did it. You did it twice. Uh-uh. Try this again. Look at the intersection. Evaluate the after image. Look at the intersection, evaluate the after image. <laughs> it's much better when the color is constrained by a border. Another version, look at the intersection, see if the color will fill a completely different shape. And now look at the intersection and explicitly see the color flow out the hole. Here's another thing that, that an artist did that takes advantage of differences in resolution. So I wrote this book about vision and art 
and my editor said it was obvious I knew a lot about vision, but it was equally obvious I knew nothing about art history. And so he told me I had to read a book about art history. So I read Gombrich, and I only got to the Renaissance because I got to the Mona Lisa. And Gombrich says, I know you've seen this painting hundreds of times, but look at it as if you've never seen it before. There is a good reason why this painting is one of the most popular paintings in the world. Mona Lisa's smile changes as you look at it. It makes her seem alive. So I want you to look at this bigger version, and I want you to look at her eyes and think about how much she's smiling, and then look at her mouth and think about how much she's smiling, and move your gaze back and forth between her eyes and her mouth. Does she look like she's smiling more when you're looking at her eyes than when you're looking directly at her mouth? Gombrich says the reason her expression varies is because Leonardo used suffumato. That is, he, blur he made her smile blurry. But that would just mean that her smile is ambiguous and it should change depending on your mindset. Instead, it seems to depend on where you're looking, and that is very low level. And as a visual neurophysiologist, I know that your acuity falls off dramatically from your center of gaze. So you have very high resolution vision wherever you're looking, and much lower resolution vision a little bit farther out. So if you look at that center dot, all those letters are equally readable. They're all 10 times over threshold. So that's how much your vision, your acuity falls off with eccentricity. That's why you have to move your eyes when you read. You can only see letters with your central vision. But your peripheral vision isn't just a bad version of your central vision. Instead, it's actually better at seeing big, blurry things. So if you filter the Mona Lisa in such a way that you see what she would look like to your peripheral vision using low spatial frequency, and what she would look like to your central vision if you could see the whole thing with your central vision all at once, which of course you can't. And I hope you see that her smile is more apparent to your peripheral vision than it is to your central vision. So as you move your eyes around that painting, and you have to move your eyes constantly. If you don't move your eyes, your vision fades. You move your eyes two or three times a second. So as you move your eyes around this painting, her expression changes. And it that gives a dynamic quality to a static image. And 500 years ago, a dynamic quality to a static image was something very special. It also gives her a coy quality that Gombrich mentions. You're looking at the background, she seems to be grinning from ear to ear, and you try to look at her mouth fast enough to catch her, and she stops. I think the pointillists figured out Something else that, that has to do with your, your central and peripheral acuity. They talk about the vibrant colors with the dot paintings that they made, and they, they attribute this to additive color mixing. But you, you know, that the color is combined not subtractively by combining absorbances, but additively by combining what the light that's reflected. But magazine illustrations are made up of little dots of color, and there is nothing special about the colors in a magazine illustration, right? Instead, I think the vibrancy of the colors in pointillist paintings comes from the fact that with your central vision, you see the dots. With your peripheral vision, you see the river and the boat and the trees. So as you move your eyes around this image, again, different, it changes. Different parts flip from being a river to being a bunch of dots. And in something like this painting, if you're looking right at this reflection, you see dots. If you're looking over here at this rock, the dots merge into lines. And if you look even farther away, it turns into a solid reflection of that boat. And that's what real water does. Sometimes it's dots, sometimes it's lines, sometimes it's solid surfaces. So it, it, it creates a lively sensation because as you move your eyes around, the painting changes completely. Chuck Close does the same thing with these huge tiles of color. Your central vision sees the tiles, your peripheral vision sees Chuck Close. And photo mosaics invented by Robert Silver as a homework assignment when he was at MIT. Your central vision sees baseball cards, your peripheral vision sees Babe Ruth. 
So now I want to talk a little bit about how we see objects. So I told you our ventral stream is important for object recognition. If you get lesions in your ventral stream, you lose the ability to recognize particular categories of objects, sometimes all objects. One of the kinds of objects that our ventral stream is particularly specialized to process is faces. So if I show you these images in a tenth of a second, you are not only detecting faces, you can recognize individual people in a tenth of a second. And you can do it whether they're cartoons, whether they're degraded, whether they're obscured, and you can do it better than any computer program. Artists have cottoned on to what may be important about the way we process faces because they've figured out that a veridical line drawing is harder to recognize than a caricature. Why is a caricature so good at evoking an identity compared to a veridical line drawing? Well, what is a caricature? Technically, what a caricature is, is that you take a person's face, figure out what, how that face differs from the average face, and then exaggerate the difference. So we have looked at how face cells work by recording from face cells. So people have, if you look at not only in neurology because you can lose face perception with a stroke, but in functional MRI you can see that there are regions in our temporal lobes that are dedicated to processing faces. This is also true in monkeys. So monkeys have particular regions in their temporal lobe that are used for processing faces. And monkeys, like us, are very social animals and they use faces to recognize conspecifics and to convey important social information. So face cells, we've recorded from these face cells. They will, they fire, they're, they're activated by people faces, they're activated by monkey faces, and they're activated by cartoon faces. So we use the fact that anything you would, that they're activated by anything you would call a face, and we used cartoon faces to probe how face cells in monkeys code faces. What do they care about? So we developed this cartoon face set where we have 20 different face parameters things that we can vary that have to do with the eyes, the nose, the mouth, the shape of the face, the hair, and so on. We varied everything we could think of. And we varied all these parameters simultaneously, like this. And we varied them what, to what we thought were extreme values, way outside of normal primate face space, in order to find out what cells care about. So we'd show a face cell this whole series of images, and record spikes and say what was the image right before each spike to find out how each parameter contributed to the firing of the face cell. And here are three face cells. You don't have to look at much data, just this one, okay? Each row is one cell, each column is one parameter, and if the cell sort of stays in this gray range, it means it doesn't care about that parameter. But this cell cares more about the shape of the eyebrows. It fires a lot when the eyebrows are slanted like this, and it's inhibited when the eyebrows are slanted like this. Uh, these, uh, these two cells fire a lot when the, when the inter-eye distance is small, and they're inhibited when the inter-eye distance is large, and so on. So what, you, what we found was that different face cells coded different constellations of parameters. Each of them cared about two or three parameters, and if we look at the shape of the tuning, if you had a cell that, if you had a cell that cared about inner eye distance, if you wanted to code inter eye distance, you might imagine that you might want to have different cells peaking in their response to different average inner eye distances that you would encounter in everyday life. Instead, what we found, and you can see that in that cell, is that we would find cells peaking at one extreme or the other. That's actually a more efficient way of doing it than having cells that peak at all different intermediate values because you only need two cells to do this and you get everything in between for free from the ratio of those two cells. So ramp shape tuning or opponent tuning is efficient. It's consistent with caricature because it means that what a face cell is telling you is how does this face differ from the average? Face cells are essentially taking a caricature of every face they look at. 
And of course artists know this. Even Picasso, he, paint, he makes portraits of all kinds of different people and they look weird, but if you put each of these portraits next to a photograph of the person that they're of, you can see that he's making caricatures, right? This is Picasso himself, Igor Stravinsky, Gertrude Stein, wife, 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 wife of a friend, girlfriend, mother-in-law, art dealer. But they're all caricatures, aren't they? He's, he's extracted what's unique about each of those people and painted it. So ramp shape tuning is not only consistent with caricature, it means that face processing involves within category comparison. It means that you are comparing the face you're looking at to some average face. So it means that face processing, like everything I told you about earlier, is also opponent. And it's local because it's within cortical space because face processing is clustered. So I told you that early visual cortex maps the visual world systematically. Higher visual cortex is divided up into categories. So you'll have regions of, of temporal cortex that are devoted to faces. You'll have other regions that are devoted to body parts and still other regions that are devoted to faces. So the fact that face cells are clustered means that local inhibitory connections get you comparisons between different face cells. So that gives you opponency in face processing. So I want to illustrate opponency in face processing by showing you a face after effect. I want you to look at these numbers. So the reason you're looking at these numbers is so that you will get an after image that is not some dumb little local after image, no retinal after image. Instead, you're developing a high level face identity after effect. So now I'm going to show you two identical morphs. I hope you saw a face after effect, a face identity after effect. So. Vision is information processing. I keep saying that. You can see manifestations of the fact that vision is information processing, not just images, by looking at art. You can see this in children's art. If you ask a three-year-old child to draw a, fa a person, you will get a face on legs. Any three-year-old child. The child is telling you what's important about a person, their face. That's the most significant thing. And so the child is giving you back what he has taken in about who that person is by giving you their face. This is a drawing a child made of her pregnant mother, a, th a face on legs inside of a face on legs. So. I don't think I've ever been invited to a philosophy meeting before, but I've been invited to anthropology meetings before. And anthropologists carry on about the religious significance of these fertility symbols that you find if you dig in the ground in places. And, and I'm sitting there in the back thinking to myself, I don't think this is really very mystical. I think if you ask a male, any male, what are the important parts of a female, this is what you're going to get. Matisse says this explicitly. He says, I don't paint things. I paint the differences between things. And that's what information processing is. It's figuring out how what's going on differs from what you expected. Another weird meeting that I got invited to that I almost didn't go to, was at the Museum of Art and Design in New York. And it was, a, it, was a con, it was a round table discussion of an exhibit of dioramas. Do you know what dioramas are? Do your middle school children get these shoe boxes and make little scenes of wars and stuff in them? Right, those are dioramas. And I thought, I don't want <laughs> to go to a meeting about dioramas. My children are not in middle school anymore and I don't have to do this anymore. But I went and I was really glad I did because these things were exquisite. They were little tiny versions of scenes that you would not think about twice. They were scenes of urban decay and scenes of 
mundane things, and yet they were fascinating looking. And I started thinking, what, and, and you ask an artist what they're doing, and they say, I'm trying to get the viewer to see it differently. And I started thinking, maybe that really is what they're doing. And why is that? Well, so these are the different kinds of agnosias you can get from lesions in your temporal lobe. You can selectively lose the ability to recognize small objects. You can selectively lose the ability to recognize big objects or places. You can lose the ability to recognize faces, writing, body parts. That means that there are parts of your temporal lobe dedicated to processing these particular object categories. And I think that means that you become expert at processing these object categories because if you have clustered processing of some object category, you can do within category comparison. And that makes you very good at that object category just having cells next to each other. So I'm gonna show you, now you know what this illusion is, it was invented by Peter Thompson. It's the Margaret Thatcher illusion, except that's not Margaret Thatcher. And you know what I've done, right? You've seen this before, that I've, I've messed around with one part of her face. I mean, several parts of her face by flipping them upside down. And even though you know it, think about how you're perceiving these two faces, knowing that you're processing these two faces with your not face part of your brain. You're not processing this in an expert manner. And now I'm gonna flip it over, and even though you know what I did, I hope you're surprised by what it looks like. Now you're processing it with your face cortex. You are processing it in an expert manner. And I think when something doesn't qualify as that category, it doesn't get processed by that module. And I think if something is the wrong size, it doesn't get processed by the appropriate module. So I think when artists make things different sizes, when they alter the scale, that makes you process it differently. And you see it in a way that you didn't see it before. And that's what artists are often trying to do, getting you to see something in a different way. Or even just putting it in the wrong place makes you see it different. Now here, you are processing, this is the same thing I showed you before. You're processing it with your not face cortex. And now you're processing it with your face cortex. It's amazing the difference, right? So now I want to talk about the fact that perception, you look out on the world and it seems to be stable, right? It doesn't seem to be jumping around. And yet, your eyes are moving constantly. So your retinal image is jumping. So if you close one eye and tap gently on the lid of the other eye so you can make the retinal image jump, the world jumps, right? Right, so you're tapping on the lid of the open eye and you're getting the world to jiggle. Very unpleasant, I'm sorry. You didn't have to touch your eye, just the outside of it. And here you can see your eye movements for reasons that are not clear to me in this Aki Kitioka drawing. It's a static image, but you can see your own eye movements. If you don't move your eyes, vision fades. So if you look very carefully at that cross, you can get that purple, blurry purple spot to fade, right? And if you look at it, it comes back. So get it to fade and then move your eyes and it'll come back. So that's, the, that's why you have to move your eyes. Things fade. If you look at the B for a little while, I bet the blue border fades upward. And if, then if you look at the P, the pink starts dominating. And I think Mark Rothko was fiddling around with this in many of his very dark paintings. There's a lovely set of them at the Tate Modern. And, 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 and I think the blurry edges, the, the, the close in luminance paints that he use, uses allows this fading and he makes it contemplative and he says it's mystical. I think it's Troxler fading, which is the psychology term for this, which I don't think is mystical, but that's okay. I think that film editors have figured out important things about how we deal with the fact that we're moving our eyes constantly and how we manage to see the world as static. Film editors figured out that you should cut on motion. That's one of the rules of film editing. So let me show you Peter Say's demonstration of this. Where's Peter Say? Here it is. Here's a demonstration of why I think cutting on motion works. So if you, so you can see those red dots are really changing, right? The ones at the top. But if you look carefully at that little red dot at the bottom, 
and track it. I hope you notice what, if you can successfully track that dot at the bottom, the big dots at the top seem to pause in their movement. Do you see that? So if you move your eyes, you don't see changes. So that's why film editors, I think, um, cut on motion is because you don't see changes that happen. And that's the idea of cutting, is to not see the change that, that happened that the film editor, need, that the producer needs for the storyline, right? So here's a little, um, oh, I forgot to get sound. Did I ask anybody for sound? <laughs> this is a little late, I guess, right? My thing won't make sound. All right, let me see if I can say it while I do this. Margaret, if you put the microphone on the stand near the oh, computer, Oh, good idea. You might. All right, let's see if that works. Yeah, let's see what happens. This is just a little, um, let's see what happens. It might work. That's not the computer we're using, Colin. Oh my god. <laughs> Shh, go sit, oh. Colin. Let me see what happens. Okay. It might work. We'll put the sound up. Two shots. Go from a wide shot to a close up. Did you see the wide shot to the close up? All right, good. I didn't need that, it's okay. So you can go from a wide shot to a close up if you cut on motion. Now there, the visual system, so we can conclude that the visual system ignores changes that, that occur during eye movements, but we still have to link one frame to the next, right? In order to make the whole thing seem continuous. There are perfectly intelligent people in my field who think that what we do is remap the visual world every time we move our eyes. If you read the Journal of Neurophysiology, it is hard to find an issue that does not have an article about the remapping of the visual world every time you move your eyes. And it is plausible that you could remap the visual world in a Cartesian coordinate system, but it is completely impossible that you could remap a zoom. And yet we have no trouble accepting a zoom in a motion picture. So instead, what I think the visual system does is link together things that have, in particular, dorsal stream properties in common, common position in space, common motion, and possibly a little bit of common shape. And I'm going to show you a video that I downloaded from the web showing a lovely series of cuts that are much less salient than they would be See, they're linking by common motion. So, linking by motion. So the last thing I want to talk about is stereopsis. So, this is stereopsis. If you look with both eyes open through your glasses, blue on the right, you will see what I mean by stereopsis. And some of you don't know what I'm talking about because you don't have stereopsis, so don't worry about it. Blue on the right, both eyes open. So stereopsis, oh sorry, I didn't mean to take your glasses. So stereopsis is the fact that you have two eyes that are separated by a couple of inches and they look at the world at, from slightly different points of view. And your visual system uses the differences in the images in the two eyes to compute distance and depth. So if you're focused on that dot, it casts images on corresponding parts of your two retinas. But things that are nearer or farther away cast images on non-corresponding parts of your two retinas. And your visual system uses these differences as part of its computation of distance and depth. So if you go to a, a museum and you see a painting that has a lot of depth cues with perspective and shading and stuff like that, the perspective and shading are contributing to a sense of three-dimensionality, but your stereo system is saying, no, I'm sorry, it's quite flat. So if you want it to look more three-dimensional, you should close one eye and you will seem to fall into the painting because your stereo system is no longer contradicting what the artist did. But stereo matching is a difficult computational problem. So if I tell you, no glasses yet, that blue is white to your right eye and red is white to your left eye, can you see what this shows? I can't, you can't figure it out. But if you put on the glasses, blue on the right, some of you will immediately see something pop out at you. And if you want to get really fancy, you can put red on the right and it'll reverse. So 
It's a difficult computation. Your visual system does it instantly and effortlessly, but your visual system can make mistakes. So if you have four identical images in the real world, the correct answer is to match corresponding images in your two eyes. But you can mismatch this image in the left eye with, the other with this image in the right eye, and you'll get the same object at a different distance or depth. So if you've ever misstepped on an escalator, you, you know what I mean, the escalators with the slats on them? Because it has these repeating slats, your visual system can misfuse the slats in an escalator, and you step in the wrong place. I think they should fix that. And I think that the Impressionists and the Post-Impressionists figured out how to achieve a sense of depth in their paintings by having lots of little speckly things that you can misfuse in your two eyes to create a sense of a volume. So these speckles, if you misfuse them in your two eyes, the painting seems to kind of become three-dimensional. This is one of the these paintings look more three-dimensional with both eyes open than with, but then with one eye open. And this painting I find kind of disturbingly three-dimensional because you misfuse the, the leaves uh, between the two eyes. But what's peculiar about this is that the guy who painted it, Klimt, could not have seen any depth in that painting. He was stereo blind. How do I know he was stereo blind? He's cross-eyed. Look at him. There's no way that he could have had normal stereopsis. I told you the computations for distance and depth start early in the visual system where you have the visual world mapped onto the cortex systematically. And if your eyes are not lined up, the images in the two eyes don't end up in the same place in the cortex. So you cannot have stereopsis if your eyes aren't lined up. And I got interested in the idea that this might have something to do with artistic talent when I was looking at, um, looking, at the th looking at what happens with equal luminant text. Equal luminant text is hard to read. You don't even want to look at this, right? It's very unpleasant to read. And people with dyslexia, which is a selective problem in learning to read, despite normal intelligence and normal education, often complain that black and white text has this shimmery, nasty, eerie quality. And I did some experiments with people with dyslexia and discovered that they had a very slight timing difference in the, in the f normally faster sub wear subdivision of their visual system. So, what are the other symptoms of dys... And I was privileged to meet a number of people with dyslexia in these studies. And there were a huge number of very talented artists, musicians, computer programmers, and actors in this population of dyslexics. And it's been documented that dyslexics are overrepresented in the artistic population, but the usual explanation is they weren't good at academic subjects, so they spent all their time in the art room. But the people that I met were so talented, I began to consider the possibility that something about the dyslexic brain might make them better at art than the rest of us. So I started asking. It, it, here's some of the symptoms of dyslexia in addition to the problems learning to read. They have positional information problems, they have figure ground problems, and they often have trouble gauging distance and depth. They have similar problems in the auditory system, and the auditory system is, oh, uh, and what are, the, what are the characteristics of the ventral stream? Motion, depth, figure ground segregation. Those, those properties of the dorsal stream match with some of the non-reading symptoms of dyslexia. There are auditory issues in, there, the auditory system may similarly be subdivided into a fast and slow subdivision, and so a timing difference in the fast subdivision in the auditory system may not only make kids with dyslexia have trouble with phonemes, which are a very fast auditory discrimination compared to music, it may also make them better at music. But I don't work on the auditory system, so I want to talk about something really simple. What about trouble gauging distance and depth? making a kid just a little better than his peers at drawing things. So I can't draw a chair. If I try to draw a chair, I cannot, I don't have access to my early retinal images. I only have access to the three-dimensional information my visual system has extracted 
and so I can't draw the chair. But maybe a kid who sees the world as slightly flat may be better at drawing three-dimensional things than, than his peers. So we looked at a bunch of artists. Here's Chuck Close. He has anisometropia, that is two eyes have different magnifications. He says he sees the world as flat and he is severely dyslexic. You can tell if someone could have normal stereopsis by looking at the white spot in their eyes, the, the light reflection. And if the light reflection is in exactly the same place in their two eyes, they could have normal stereopsis. Now remember, 10% of otherwise normal people have no stereopsis. It's quite common not to have stereopsis. Here's some baseball players. You can see where the light reflex is in exactly the same place in both their eyes. Another baseball player. So you've got this. This is called the Hirschberg test. Ophthalmologists use it to figure out whether people's eyes are lined up by looking at, looking at a photograph with a source of illumination that's far away. So you can do this now, right? There's one baseball player who did not have normal stereopsis. This is Babe Ruth. The light reflex is centered in this eye and it's off to the side in this eye. Babe Ruth had amblyopia. That is, he was essentially blind in one eye because he didn't use it because the brain rejects often when you have double vision, it will reject the input from one eye. So we looked at a bunch of famous artists to say could they or could they not have had normal stereopsis. So I told you 10% of otherwise normal people have no stereopsis, but only 3% of the population has eyes misaligned. That's the reason why they have no stereopsis. So it's not common to have severely misaligned eyes. So we looked at a bunch of famous artists, looked at like 50 of them at the beginning, and we expected to find one or two who had misaligned eyes. We found 16 right off the bat. So Andrew Wyeth, this eye is looking at you, that eye is looking out that door. His father, N.C. Wyeth, who was also an illustrator, who was an illustrator, also an artist, was also wall-eyed. Edward Hopper was wall-eyed. You see the light reflex is right near the pupil on this eye, and it's off on the edge of the iris on this eye. Kara Walker. And Kara Walker works in silhouettes. How flat can you get? I don't know about the dog. Mark Chagall was cross-eyed. Frank Stella was cross-eyed. Jasper Johns was wall-eyed, his eyes deviated outward. Robert Rauschenberg was wall-eyed and severely dyslexic. Alexander Calder was wall-eyed. Man Ray was wall-eyed. Frank Lloyd Wright. Now, I told you it's a, ophthalmologists call this the Hirschberg test, to look at a photograph and evaluate the alignment of the eye. You are allowed to do this with a photograph. Obviously, you're not allowed to do this with a painting because you paint the left eye and then you paint the right eye, the eyes have moved all around between times. But I was at the Louvre and there is a little room there that has nothing in it but four Rembrandt self-portraits. All four of them show him with his eyes, one eye looking straight ahead and the other eye deviating outward. And I know that when you paint a self-portrait, you look in a mirror and when you're painting your right eye, you look to the right, when you're painting your left eye, you look to the left. So here's a montage of me. This half I'm looking at my right eye, this half I'm looking at my left eye. And, and the light reflex is in slightly different places in my two eyes, even though I have stereopsis. But my eyes are not nearly as deviated as Rembrandt portrays himself as being. So I had a young colleague, who himself was a stereo blind artist, and he came into my office and said, wow, that's cool, is it always the same eye? And I said, no, sometimes it's the eye on this side that deviates out, and sometimes it's the eye on this side that deviates out. And my young colleague, himself being a stereo blind artist, said, Marge, you have to separate the paintings and the etchings. <clears throat> so we did that. And in the paintings, it turns out it was always the eye on this side that deviates outwards. And in the etchings, it was always the eye on this side. Maybe you knew this. You make an etching and you flip it over to paint it, I mean to print it. So 
That would mean if there's a systematic difference between the etchings and the paintings, it's not because it was a trope. It wasn't something he wanted to achieve for stylistic reasons. He was drawing or painting what he saw, and one of his eyes deviated outwards. So we did a little program where we outlined the eyes, we outlined the irises, and we measured where the two were relative to each other and the two eyes, and we made a graph. And my conclusion is that if you can make a graph of something really unusual, you can get it published. And in the etchings, it was generally the eye on the left that was centered, the eye on the right deviated. In the paintings, it was the reverse in general, except for this one, which we, this is the one in Berlin, which is either a fake or he painted it from an etching. Hmm. We don't know. So I'm done. I, here are some take home messages if you want. Vision is information processing. That's the main one, right? And you have different parts of your visual system that do different things. Some of the most evolutionarily old aspects of our vision are completely colorblind. You don't have to color in the lines, and people are different. And at the end, maybe you could return the stereo glasses. Thank you. And I'm happy to, to try to answer questions. Margaret, thank you. So, time for questions, please. Yeah, that was fascinating, because I'm coming to it as a different direction as an artist, that <coughs> there were some things I wanted to say about that, but the question was, you said something, if I've understood it, about colour, not you needing colour to access depth, and something about colour and resolution, and I was thinking, if I have a photograph with a very high resolution file, and you print it on particularly nice photo rag paper, you get, for me, it seems you get very different colours and a very phys different physical sensation. When I look at that image, I want to touch it, I want to feel it. It makes me think different things. And if I have a very low resolution file, I print it on different paper, the colours look very different, I get a different physical response. So I see colour as being absolutely intrinsic. I, I can't see it as being irrelevant. Well, have you ever read Oliver Sacks' description of Mr. I? the painter who lost color vision from a cortical lesion? No, I haven't read that. It was in the New York Review of Books. I think it's now in one of his books. The, uh, the peculiar thing that this artist noted was everything looked like it was in shades of gray, but he felt like his acuity was much higher. So even though the, the, ventral, stream, the ventral stream has a slightly lower acuity, there's something weird about the dorsal stream that makes you feel like you have higher acuity. And all of the hyperacuities, our abilities to see things at a finer than a photoreceptor spacing, are characteristic of the dorsal stream. So I don't know the answer to your question. I think it's, I think there's a misleading introspection of how fine things are. Does that make sense? Not totally. When you were talking, it was making me think about why when we see black and white photographs and there's just different tones, sometimes we see it very differently from the colour photograph and it has a... Sometimes we're more complicated in our response to it or we see something we wouldn't otherwise. But I don't understand what you've just... Your last sentence just now, you said about an introspective... Because I think if you look at a physical object, it's not just trying to represent something. It is doing all sorts of other things. It can be quite ambiguous. It can make our senses respond, it can respond to emotions or experience we've had or thoughts or ideas, all sorts of things. It's not just literally representing reality, a piece of work or colour. Okay, but you have to refine your thoughts. That's when you start looking at content rather than yeah. the just the purely visual field of things. Is it not both? Do you not well, get both, a different but sensation physically? But from altering the colour alters the content. I think, I think we'll stop there because yeah. other people Sorry. to bring in. Greg Curry. Um, what one of the messages seem to be that artists exploit features of our visual system in order to achieve certain kinds of effects. But once or twice, I, I got the impression that you wanted to go beyond that and suggest that the fact that they exploit those features is evidence that they had some knowledge or understanding of what those features were. You said this in relation to the public times to Picasso. I'd use the word empirical. Sorry, so I'd use the word empirical. That they experiment, they experiment with vision. 
I doubt that they explicitly, some of them explicitly experimented with vision, like Leonardo, but he actually never wrote about the, the blurring and the different parts of your visual field. So he may have discovered something without explicitly knowing the underlying neurobiology. Well, it just seems to me that it's perfectly possible to exploit a feature of the visual system without having the faintest idea how what that feature yes, is. Yes, I agree. I didn't want to. I didn't want to be mean to them. I, I think they were more empirical than. than yes. Come on. Say yes to something else. Oh, that's um, right. Uh, you gave a number of examples of, um, of the way in which the the filtering, the translation of visual system is, becomes reflected in the, in the properties of paintings. I'm going to give a particular example of the candle in which you pointed out that the luminance of the reflecting surface was the same as the luminance of the candle itself. Um, and your, you said your photograph in which the candle was much brighter appeared much brighter than the surface was not how you saw the original scene. How can that be? How can the view, your photograph, if it's accurate in its limits distribution, be any different from viewing the original scene? And how can it be that artists incorporate the constancies and the translations in their pictures without those <coughs> pictures then looking wrong because we retranslate them to our visual systems? I mean, surely the, the, this is comes from the whole robbery theory that artists have to get back, as it were, to the purity of the original scene in order for your visual system then to take over in the way that theirs did when they looked at the scene, but which they had to ignore if they had to recreate the same perception in others. They are required to cheat, and they use what is called chiaroscuro. The problem is there's only a 20-fold range of luminances, reflectances, between the blackest black and the whitest white. And in a real scene, there's also the same pigments, but you've also got three-dimensionality with things reflecting off in different ways. So you've got a hundredfold, a thousandfold differences in luminance across a real scene. And so the painter has to compress it and then make it look more expanded. And they take advantage of our center surround cells by changing the background to do this. But that's not, you're not answering explicitly the question. Um, you can't you, make a picture that reproduces not, the lights. That's not answering my question. Oh, you, all right. In the, in the view, you said that the brightness, by right to the brightness on the canvas of the, of the pigment was the same for the candle and the surface, the, the tunic, whatever that was reflecting it. Well, the artist, of course, could have made that darker, no problem with the reflectance range, but they chose not to, which gives the tunic an unreal character, even when you look at the painting, it looks wrong because the tunic appears to be self-luminous, because it is too bright compared to the candle. Now, why is it? I think it's a mistake, actually, I mean, an error of inventing, which most good artists avoid. But here's the same problem. Let's go find a line. You can't reproduce this. You reproduce this veridically, you won't see what you see now. It's the same problem, right? How could, how could you make a photograph or a painting where the line would be black and the screen would be white? You've just got this problem of the reflectances. It doesn't work. Ha. Yes, All right. gentlemen. <laughs> we can argue at lunch, Colin. Um, I, I heard a story where someone said to Michelangelo, uh, mm -hmm. no, it's the other way. Anyway, let me get to straight to the point. How does sculpting fit into all this? Can you, can you, is it a totally different ballpark artistically? I thought I was doing pretty well to get into movies. I, I mean, I don't know, I, I'm sure sculpt, oh, here I can tell you something about it. Not much though. So if you lose stereo as an adult, you find more three-dimensional, more three-dimensionality in dioramas and bas relief, bas relief, right? Because you see, you create more depth. I don't know, I don't, I don't know about sculpture. It's already three-dimensional, and it doesn't have much color in it. So I don't have anything useful to say about that. You mentioned the Ron Muir, where he's really playing. Yes. All the yes. Right. So oh yeah. There you go. 
I'd forgotten about that. Okay, helpful. Um, Fiona McPherson, and I've got the other people on the list. Um, so you, hi, uh, you spoke about, um, and you mentioned several times that you think that visual processing is local, and you gave us some nice examples of that, so the inhibitory effect um, and so on. But a lot of what you went on to say seemed to be examples of where visual processing wasn't local. So, for example, you talked about vision as parallel, and um, you talked about various top down effects where the queer, uh, queer an object is placed, if the urinal is placed in a very different um, uh, position than you would expect, you get effects on perception. There are theories that suggest um, feature binding occurs by synchronous firing in different areas of the brain. So, what do you mean by local and do you want to stand by that or do you want to say it's just local and not Yes, well it's both hierarchical, so we have many, many, many visual areas, but all the long range connections are excitatory. And so I meant locally inhibitory, that, that one of the biggest parts of our computation is this local inhibitory feedback. But in addition, we have a lot of fancier processing that, that is hierarchical. And I oversimplified by stressing the local inhibition. Yes, I, I agree with that. Interested um, in a particular example of um, stereopsis. Uh, I don't have a 3D TV, but in my local shopping centre, they're constantly advertising these, so constantly having a look uh, as I go by. And um, it just struck me yesterday, funnily enough, that you had the example of a diorama. If I remember it, these, the, you have, might have a foreground, a middle ground, and a, and a background sort of thing. So you have these flat planes, but the, the things uh, might be in relief as well, so they have a kind of uh, a strange sort of segregation of planes and flatness and yet depth at the same time. I find, I just, I wonder if, if, if this is a, a, a kind of, it seems very artificial to me, stereopsis. It, it, I get a very profound sense of depth in a peculiar way, but it also seems to be segregated into, into planes like that. There's also a problem with accommodation, of course, if you if you look at particular parts, that, that you, so you're getting sort of, um, I don't know what you call it, antagonistic effects. Or so how long have you felt this way? <laughs> every, time I, every time I look at a stereo image, I think it, 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 the more pronounced the depth is, or the more it seems to come out, uh, the, 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 the more I, I can, or some of I was it, asking, I was getting it whether it's been since you were about 40. Because that's when you start having kind of fixed planes in your vision because if your accommodation doesn't work anymore. Sorry, it doesn't. So, so you'll probably have a fixed plane of focus. I certainly do. But I, I don't know why it's... Why. So the way stereo cells work is... Colin's recorded from a lot of them. We tend to have cells that peak at zero disparity a lot of them, and then we have cells that say it's farther away, it's nearer, that's all. So that, you're probably right, we do tend to have n not really a gradation, but something in plane and then in front of or behind. Okay, personal consultation later. Uh, Martin Kemp. Yeah, thanks, this goes back to Greg's question, and it's historical, but it does have a cautionary tale built into it. If we think about when it was that there's a first a theorizing of what we call subjective effects, we get it, as far as I know, first of all, in Ibn al Haytham, al Hazan, the uh, Persian Arab. I, I don't know what you, start over. I don't know what you just said. What do you mean, subjective effects? Well, effects which are not out there optical, but which are part of the, not defined by external optics, but defined by the, the sexual system, by, by subjective effects. Okay. Yeah. Um, the first time those are discussed, as far as I know, is Ibn al-Haytham, um, al Hazan is often called in the West, and he talks about things which are outside the range of moderateness, that are too fast, too contrasty, too bright, too dark. That's picked up by Leonardo, who discusses things like blur in a moving wheel and so on. And he specifically says, these are for the speculatori and not for painters. So that, ah. uh, so that he, he is saying there are things I know which are about perception, as we would call it. He doesn't use that 
but that these would be bad manners in painting. To show a wheel blurred, like Velasquez does in Las, Min uh, in, uh, Las Elandras, it lies outside it because it wouldn't look enough wheel-like. So there is some pretty sophisticated discussion of edge effects and complementary contrast and all these things, certainly from the Renaissance onwards. But artists do say, and it's a cautionary tale in this respect, that there are things which we can identify perceptually, which functionally, in terms of what the work of art is and the job it does in its historical context, lies outside it. So they're saying, don't just simply think that art and perception are the same things, that the, the functionality of art, its content, its meaning, its role and what is good pictorial manners and what is bad pictorial manners has a radical effect upon how far the perceptual things, even when the artist is conscious of them, feeds through to the work of art. Oh yes, I think artists not only figure these things out empirically, it's not unconscious. They communicate with each other techniques for doing things, absolutely. But they don't necessarily talk about it in terms of nerve cells. That's yeah, all so, I meant to yeah, say. So, yeah. Marina Wallace. Yeah, um, to sort of follow up from that, even though I, uh, I would have said it anyway, um, <laughs> is that looking at the Canaletto painting that you showed, um, and you went to check yes. the shadow, a painting is not a photograph, and that in itself is a very complex thing to say, so I will leave it as that, because one would have then to say a, a photograph is not reality, and the use of photography for documenting science is also something that needs to be discussed. Um, the general point that is behind what I'm going to say about Canaletto's painting is that I love having art and science together and having events like this, and I do that as much as I can in my profession. Um, but we have to be very careful how we do it. And that's possibly the cautionary element here. So to go back to the Canaletto painting, accuracy, what is accuracy in a, in a painting or for an artist? It's a very important question. It's a complex question. You went to measure, you went to check the shadow. Had you checked all sorts of other things in Piazza San Marco, you would have found that they were equally inaccurate or they were also inaccurate. So it really depends how we're looking, what we're looking for, what conclusions we come to, and how we use art as evidence and how we use science as evidence. I mean, you are pretty use of doing that. You know, scientists have to be careful at how they use evidence. Well, we have to be careful at how we use evidence in art as well. So other things in Piazza San Marco are not accurate in Canaletto's painting. Loads of them. But what was that painting wanting to do? And this is really, really going on from Martin and Leonardo. There are conventions, there are intentions. There is a place for everything we do, there is a context. So very useful to use these analysis and these comparisons. But let's do it in a way, in a scientific way. Let's do it so that we are not mixing intention and context. I only meant to point out that the people who insist on using ray tracing programs, they don't need to that Piazza San Marco is perfectly acceptable, even though it, it violates the laws of physics. Yeah. I've got any questions. Chris Frith, then one, two, three, if we can. Maybe four, if we can. Yes, Chris. just very briefly to go back to the point about local effects and hierarchies. Presumably, the, the local inhibitory process at the top of the hierarchy will be much less local in some sense than the inhibitory process well, they're, they're much probably than just as local in cortex, yes, but, but what you've got next to each other is much higher level. Yeah, absolutely. Good. Yep, that's quick. Uh, Eric? Oh, um, just one thing very quickly, and then another. Um, there was an artist whose nickname was Squint in Italian, where Jean, that 
period. But um, one thing that Gombrich said is that the artist educates our vision. Right? And it seems pretty clear to me, at any rate, that the artist is also telling us how things may be represented in two dimensions, if not three. And you get this, for example, in, uh, if you look at 150 years of the English humorous magazine Punch, starting off with, say, Georges de Maurier, you know, you know right here, and how much detail is in his sketches and you know, cartoons, with coming on in the late 20th century with artists like Mark Boxer and Harold, who just had a few lines, rather like the few lines you had on the screen a moment ago. So the artist was telling us how to look, but also how to represent. Uh, so you think we learned that? Sorry? You think we learned that? Or do you think? Well, I mean, OK. You the, learned that convention? I don't know. Well, I, I, I think if you look at the, you know, through the history of art, and uh, what is you know, today just a few lines can represent everything. I mean, Gombrich said an awful lot about the beholder's share. You know, we bring a lot, and, and the purpose of eye movements is not merely so that things that fade can come back. It, the eye movements pick out, you know, it, it enable the brain if you like, to pick out the salient points of objects. We must have some kind of picture of the world inside our heads. Nope, 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 nope. Cartesian theater fallacy. Um, nope. <laughs> to pick out the information, to know what kind of information in order to recognize objects. Well, I'm talking, this no. is Gregory. No, that's the Cartesian theater fallacy. There's nothing up there to look at. No, no, it's, it's, no, it's not an image. No, it's certainly not. Oh, all right, good. But we that, good. must have some idea, OK, in cellular processes, if you like, of what the world is like. Um, <clears throat> I mean, a young infant, for example, will respond to a simplified diagram of the human face. Right? But when the various bits of the face, the nose, the eyes, are all juggled about, the child is not so interested. Yes, it but more wait, I'm gonna, I have to disagree with you here. Mm -hmm. Some people have shown that infants will track a face more than a scrambled face, but the most recent research suggests that what they're tracking is top heavy. And it doesn't have to be a face, you can turn the eyes sideways, and as long as there's more stuff going on at the top, they'll track that. This is stuff I'm doing right now in my lab, so yeah, it may be real simple. It may be profoundly simple, the kinds, we don't have face templates. We probably have spatial frequency biases that direct us, and then we learn to see those things. Sorry, Eric, we, we're, I'm going to try and get the last oh, two I questions. But I care so much about this question. In. OK, you've been waiting a long time. Let's see if we can get you in. Now, I'm an artist and visual artist. My name is John Duke. Um, it's, it seems to be perfectly clear to me as an artist that there is no binocular fusion going on in vision at all. It's just so completely obvious. That isn't a picture. That isn't nothing. When we do that, things don't jump out of us. That eye isn't even seeing. I don't know precisely where it is in space. We have huge disparity, but I, I just can't understand. I mean, what the vision science forums ages on the you know, beyond that. There are no pictures to fuse, so there's no binocular fusion going on. We may induce it, but it doesn't occur to us. And this is one of the one of the really critical things. I can create three-dimensional paintings that are like a like you in a room, um, and you know, monocularly, we understand where things are in space. The ventral stream and where doesn't come through the sounds. It's not depth in the media, it's proximity. Yes, stereo is just one of many depth cues. Oh, for sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, it doesn't, but there's no fusion of the <coughs> going on. So this whole discussion of <coughs> there is fusion happening in vision, it's quite obvious there isn't. And that's so why the I, cinemas are I quite agree all wrong, you. it's because it has nothing to do with vision. I agree with you that stereopsis is not the main reason why we have different images in the two eyes and that we process them differentially. I think we actually have, mostly it's for seeing, it's mostly it's for seeing beyond things. 
We need questions. We need to just last question, and then we must <coughs> must stop. Not a question. I'm just going to make a point. That I actually ah. think that the paradoxical shadows in the Mark Square are perfectly physically feasible, and you do get that sort of thing with borrowed light, particularly with still light. Uh, but it doesn't matter. It was all you wanted. <laughs> I mean, your points were perfectly fine, but I, on the technical point, I think that we have that. Okay, and on that irresolved note, uh, let's thank Margaret very much indeed. Thank you.